First of all, a verse in Colossians in chapter 1. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Uh, you've, you've heard me a number of times. You probably know I read many paraphrases of Scripture. Even those which others think are heretical. Not Because I don't treat a paraphrase like actual scripture. I treat a paraphrase like a commentary. <clears throat> there are good Bible commentaries which are not scripture but <clears throat> which can give you an insight into a verse which you wouldn't have otherwise. <clears throat> so I read the Living Bible and I think that's about the best paraphrase and then others like J.B. Phillips, Weymouth, Message, etc. which give us a highlight on some words which I wouldn't think of Here's one of those. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. Uh, for this reason, since the day we heard of it, we don't cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So J.B. Phillips' paraphrase says in the last part of it, that you may see things as it were from God's point of view. Livens up that verse to me more than to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. To see things as it were from, to see things from God's point of view. This whole, you know, we speak so much in the church about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. That in the new covenant we have an example and not exhortations like old covenant. Old covenant was laws, exhortations. But in the New Covenant, Jesus said, follow me. So, the secret of Jesus' life was this. And to become like Jesus, basically, means that I look at everything from God's point of view. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And whenever Jesus looked at a situation, or a person, or the future, or anything in the world. He looked at it from God's point of view. Now we have grown up <clears throat> seeing everything from man's point of view from childhood and then we go to school and mingle with so many others in the world and more and more we are reinforced in looking at things from man's point of view. We look at money from man's point of view. Very often we look at people from man's point of view. We can be prejudiced against certain people whom we don't like or partial towards certain people whom we like. It's a battle to renew our mind. And that is very often the reason why we can be uncertain of God's will. The reason why Jesus could say at the end of his life, 33 and a half years, Father, I have finished the work you gave me to do. I believe the reason was that he, every day in his life, he, as a man, just listened to what the Father had to say and did that. One of the classic examples of that is in Luke chapter 4. There are many examples. Luke chapter 4 is one of them. <clears throat> This is the place where he, he went to Simon Peter's house in verse 38 and healed her. And she was immediately healed, Luke 4, 39. And then there was sunset, verse 40. And at sunset, the whole village almost brought all those who were sick to him. And instead of doing a mass prayer, he laid his hands on every single one of them and he healed them. That must have gone late into the night. Demons came out, verse 41. And when day came, even though it was late, he got up early in the morning and went alone to some place to say, Father, what should I do? Now, 
from a human standpoint, when there's a revival like this, so many people heal, demons cast out, and such a tremendous manifestation of God's power where each one of them, verse 40, healed. Every single person in that crowd healed. And so many demons cast out. Is the ideal opportunity now to, their hearts are so open to know this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah. To take the opportunity to give them the gospel and tell them about what he had come for, to free people from sin. That's the human, even a spiritually minded man would think like that, that's the common sense thing to do. But he wanted to find out the Father's will. See, that to me is an indication of how he did not depend on himself, even in such a situation where one would think uh, the spiritual thing to do is this. And by the time he had finished prayer, people came to him. They were searching for him and tried to keep him from going away from them. In other words, they persuade, tried to persuade him, this is the place where we need you. Think of the open doors here. But he said, no, I have to go somewhere else. Because I was sent for this purpose. And he went. It looked like a missed opportunity. Yet, at the end of his life, he said, I finished the work that you need to do. To have our mind renewed like that, it says in Romans 12, is the secret of finishing the will of God in our life. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says about offering our body and our mind. Therefore, verse 12 means in the light of the wonderful explanation of the gospel in Romans 1 to 11, more clearly than in any other book in the Bible. The gospel is explained in verses chapter 1 to 11. And in, in view of this, therefore, what should you do? First of all, present your body as a living sacrifice. This is the equivalent of the Old Testament tithe. The tithe in the Old Testament, we present our body to God. And since it's more difficult to present our body, most people just pay the tithe. But this is what God wants. What is acceptable to God is presenting my body, saying, Lord, here's my eyes and here's my tongue. I never want to use them for myself anymore. You know, it's easier to pay the tithe than to say that I won't use my eyes and tongue as I like for the next 31 days. And then the mind, verse 2. Conformity to the world is in our mind not in our dress. I believe, you know, we must be dressed decently and women must be dressed modestly, but essentially, a woman dresses in a certain way or even a man dresses in a certain way because of a certain thing in his mind. It's in mind he has certain values or he does not have certain values or she does not have certain values. That's why the dress comes. So you just change a person on the outside. You haven't really changed them. A lot of people who Dress, women who dress very modestly are pretty arrogant in their mind. They're not Christ-like inwardly. It's in the mind that the world, you can be conformed to the world. So our aim is to change people's thinking in their mind. To be, you know, we are born thinking like worldly people from childhood. The things that are important to people in the world are important to us. Honor of men, money, pleasure eating good food, sleeping, and uh, not taking study of the scriptures very seriously, just bare minimum. And uh, to have that all changed, to be renewed in our mind means to think like God thinks, to see things as it were from God's point of view. Thus I can prove what the perfect will of God is, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God Look at the words used to talk about the will of God. It's good, acceptable, and perfect. And I have to prove it. It's not like in the Old Testament where from outside God spoke Abraham or Samuel. No. It's the Holy Spirit now dwells within. See, with all the hearing of God's word from the outside, they never could think like God thinks. 
It's in a moment, God said something and they did it, whether it's Abraham or Samuel or anyone. There was no permanent change in their mind to begin to think like God. That's, that could only be after the Holy Spirit comes within. It's a tremendous privilege to have the Holy Spirit within and fill us so that we begin to think like God thinks and we look at people the way God looks at them and we judge, discern people uh, in the way God discerns people. We don't condemn people. That is God's business. But we see people from God's point of view. And that happens only if we have this habit of being open to what God has to say to us every day. Uh, let's turn to a verse from Habakkuk. See, in the world, the difference between a wicked person and a righteous person is one who does a lot of evil things is wicked and one who does, you know, good things and go to church and read the Bible and pray and decent behavior is a good person. But the real definition of a wicked and a righteous person is very different in God's eyes. Here we read Habakkuk 2. In the Living Bible again, it reads like this in verse 4. The wicked person trusts in himself like these Chaldeans or like the worldly people do. But the righteous person lives by trusting in me. So the difference, the definition of wicked and righteous in God's eyes is not doing wicked things, doing good things. It's a question of who you lean upon. You either lean upon yourself, you're a wicked person, whether you know it or not. You lean upon God, you're a righteous person. The wicked one trusts in himself like the worldly people do. That's the, <clears throat> that's the verse. I like that paraphrase because I believe in the context of this, that's exactly what it means. But as the righteous person trusts in me, <clears throat> and that is faith. So when it says we must live by faith or without faith, it is impossible to please God. <clears throat> what it means is that without this life of constant dependence on God, you're not really going to please Him. Even if you do a lot of good things. <clears throat> <clears throat> and essentially, that is the choice that Adam had in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> Tree of knowledge of good and evil, where you partake and I've got it in me now. I know good and evil now. You see, one would think, what's wrong in knowing good and evil? To do evil like in, is evil is bad. But in the day you get the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. That's what the Lord told Adam. <clears throat> the day you get it, you'll die. The day you have the knowledge of good and evil resident within yourself, you will die. <clears throat> but if you refuse to have it resident within yourself and you go to the tree of life, which is a life of God, I want to live by your life, not by a store of knowledge of good and evil, which is dependence on myself. That's how the death came. And life is, say, Lord, I don't want to live depending on myself. I could be wrong. There is a way that, you know, Proverbs 14, 27, is it? And it's repeated twice in chapter 16 as well. There is a way that seems right to a man. You know that verse? But the end is death. If you don't know it, let's know it. It's good to know these verses. You know, if you are young and you remember these verses, it will be, oh, verse 12, 14, 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And that's repeated in chapter 16 also twice. So there's a way that seems right to a man, but his end is the way of death. Now, if I really believe that, there's so many things that appear right to me. And it's dangerous to go that way. So this is why the person who lives in dependence on God and says, Lord, I have no confidence in myself, is really going to be the one who 
accomplished the most in his life. And that's what we see in Jesus in that Peter's hometown. It looks right to me to be here now because it's such a response. And the door hearts of people are open, but the Lord says, no, this is not the place for you to go. You got to move on. Because God knows the hearts of people. He knows exactly where we can fulfill his will for us in the one lifetime we have. And I believe this is how Jesus lived from the time he came to an age of understanding as a little child. That it was not just by an academic knowledge of scripture, even though he knew the scriptures well enough to even discuss it with the scribes. Of course, he must know the scriptures well. But it's not an <clears throat> academic knowledge. It was listening to God that was the way Jesus lived. See in Isaiah 50 and verse 4. <clears throat> he knew what to say in each situation. Because <clears throat> he says, The Lord's gone, give me the tongue of a disciple, the Father, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with one word. And the secret of it was that <clears throat> every morning he woke up. And his ear, he allowed the father to wake up his ear, inner ear, to listen. <clears throat> As a disciple means to listen in order to obey. <clears throat> so he woke up in the morning and said, okay, I've got to hear now. What's the father saying to me? And it's not something we can just say, okay, I read my Bible today. Because I found that a lot of times when I read the Bible, I wasn't listening to God necessarily. And a lot of other days, when I did not necessarily start with the Bible in the morning, I listened. So, you know, 1400 years, Christians never had a printed Bible. How could they listen to God? How could you follow the good evangelical rule of reading the Bible every morning? They couldn't do it. If that was so important, God would have allowed printing to be discovered about 200 years before Christ. So that everybody would have a Bible. I see the wisdom of God, I don't know, but I see the wisdom of God to allow printing to be discovered in 1450 or 70 or something like that. In other words, we are to be dependent more on the Holy Spirit, like the early Christians were. They didn't have a Bible. Imagine coming to a meeting without a Bible. And the preacher coming without a Bible either. And many of us have read the Bible so much, but I've sometimes thought, I haven't tried it out yet anywhere. I said, suppose we come to a meeting like the first century Christians, all of us come without a Bible. And we're all going to prophesy. And you can't say, see what the verse before this says, and see what the verse after this says. All that intellectual stuff is gone. If you have to speak what God spoke to your heart. That is how the early Christians, they did hear scripture, they would probably go to the synagogue and read. Scriptures, there were scrolls, but people were not rich enough to afford scrolls, each of them individually. <clears throat> but this is how God wanted man. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's what we see here. He listened, and when he listened, it says, Verse 5, the Lord God opened my ear, and I was not disobedient. And when he was like that, he could face any situation, whether people spat on him or hit him, verse 6. Or it doesn't matter. He was, in whatever situation he faced after that, verse 7, he knew that his father would help him. And it didn't matter. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. And I know I will not be ashamed because I'm going in the direction which my father told me to go. <clears throat> you know, it says in John 7 that he is... He told his brothers, no, I'm not coming to Jerusalem. And five minutes later, he went. This is amazing. He, he lived by listening to the Father all the time. So, verse 9, the Lord God will help me. And if you fear God, verse 10, and you're a servant, walk like that. And if you think there's no darkness, there'll be light. But 
don't, verse 11, don't kindle your own fire. That means your bright ideas. And then cycle yourself because you, you lie down in torment. It's quite an interesting passage, that whole section from verse 4 to 11, teaching us what we read in Habakkuk. The righteous the one, the man is the one who depends on me and listens to what I have to say. This passage I referred to is one that often comes to my mind in John chapter 7. It says he had his brothers, by the way, you know, didn't believe in him. In verse 5 it says his brothers didn't believe in him and they told him, verse 3, leave here and go to Judea so your disciples can see what you're doing. Because it's the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, verse 2, and all the Jews had to go to Jerusalem at that feast. And uh, he said, so he, Jesus told him, my time has not yet here, verse 6. So your time is always opportune. You can go wherever you like, whenever you like. That's how man is. But I can't do that. I can only go to Feast of Tabernacles or no Feast of Tabernacles. I can go only if the Father tells me to go. Not because of a law says do this. You can do whatever you like. And so you go first to the feast. I won't go because my time has not fully come. And so they go. And when his brothers had gone, he himself went up secretly, verse 10. Now, doesn't it look like he told them a lie? <clears throat> As it were, I don't want to go with you fellas. So I'll say I'm not going. Now, that's the way a man would think. But I understand it completely. Uh, it's like, I often compare this to these police people who have these wireless sets in their car. They can't go. Till, are you going there? No, I'm not going there. Ten seconds later, they get a command from headquarters, go there, and they go. And it looks as if he's told a lie because he said, I'm not coming, and 15 seconds later, he's going there. This is how Jesus lived. But the brothers wouldn't understand that. When they, when he's, they see him in Jerusalem, they say, why? You said you were not coming here, man. You didn't want to walk with us. But one who listens to God is going to be misunderstood by people who don't listen to God. I'm sure his brothers misunderstood him. Jesus is always misunderstood. He never, one of the wonderful things I see about Jesus is he never tried to explain himself. See Mark's gospel. There are many of these things, you know, little, little things that you see in scripture where Mark chapter 11, where you see, I mean, if your passion in life is to walk as Jesus walked, like it says in 1 John 2, 6, that's become more and more the passion of my life. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, which Hebrews eleven forty 40 says, is the better thing than pulling down the walls of Jericho and splitting the Red Sea and all the wonderful things, shutting the mouths of lions and all the wonderful things that we wish we could do, which Old Testament people did. It says in the last words of Hebrews 11, God's provided something better. And that better thing is to look unto Jesus and live as he lived, or walk as he walked, or run as he ran. And when you see that, then you, you read the Gospels in a completely different way. You read it as it were between the lines. You don't read just the facts, which is like children's Sunday school. Jesus did this and did that. But you see behind it all. For example, we read here, Jesus uh, was going to Jerusalem. Verse 12, he left Bethany and he became hungry. At a distance he saw a fig tree and he came and found nothing in it and he cursed it. May no one eat fruit from you again. Verse 14, and his disciples are listening. Now, if you were to judge Jesus from the outside, you would say he got so upset because there were no figs there. He was hungry, it says. Uh, verse 12, and he came there to see if he would find anything on it. And this is one of those places where you see clearly that though he was God, he did not use the prerogatives of God 
of knowing everything, omniscience. He had to come to the fig tree. He was hungry, 100% a man, you see there. And seeing, oh, there was no figs. And then why does he curse it? And his, it says, it's very interesting what Mark writes, his disciples were listening. And this guy is upset <laughs> there are no figs. He's hungry and there are no figs here. But he was not upset. He says, uh, he was trying to teach them a lesson in faith. You see that next morning, verse 20, they saw the fig tree withered. And he said, Labai, this thing you cursed us, it is already withered. And he says, have faith in God. That's what, that's the reason why he cursed it. There's always a reason why Jesus does something. And like he says in 1 Corinthians 2, the natural man cannot understand a spiritual man. Why does a spiritual man do certain things certain ways? If you're not spiritual, you will not understand. You think he got upset. We're not to judge by what our eyes see or our ears hear. He wanted to teach them faith. This is not only this fig tree. If you say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, it'll happen. So when you pray, believe that you receive them. And when you stand praying, forgive. Because it's because you don't forgive that you can't have faith very often. And then your father will forgive. There's a close connection between forgiveness and faith as well. Forgiving others. It's so important. Jesus stressed that so much. Make sure you're forgiven everybody. Dear brothers, I really believe many people don't have enough faith because there's someone they haven't forgiven. Something somebody did is always rankling in their mind. We can't get rid of the memory of it. But if I don't have an attitude of forgiveness, I always have a way I look at him or think about him. No wonder I find it difficult to believe in times of stress or in a difficult situation. Pray you believe, but if you want to believe, you better forgive everybody. So that is what Jesus, this amazing section from verse 22 onwards to 26 came up through the cursing of the fig tree. So it's not because he was upset. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is, uh, because Jesus was listening, I believe he was prompted by the Holy Spirit to curse the tree. And he did it. I can't imagine, I mean, even I wouldn't be upset if I didn't uh, get what I wanted. I went to the store to buy something and they ran out of what I wanted. What I wanted. <laughs> I'm not going to be upset. And Jesus was way ahead of us. See, he's not upset with anything. His life was a perfect rest. He prompted by the Father, he cursed the tree. And then they came to Jerusalem, and listen to this. He entered the temple, but before this, I want you to see verse 11. Just the previous day, Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. Now what is happening in the temple? That is mentioned in verse 15. There were people selling tables of money, sellers of doves, they were all there the previous day as well, verse 11. And it says he looked around at everything and uh, it was late and he went away. He saw all these people selling doves, making money, the tables of the money changers. He looked around, looking around at everything, verse 11, he went away. Next morning, he comes back to the same temple, just 24 hours later, and he drives out these people, overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of doves and wouldn't permit anything and says, my house is called a house of prayer. You made it a robber's den. Wasn't it a robber's den the previous day as well? He would not act until prompted by the Father, even if he sees something terribly wrong. There's a time and a season for everything, like it says in Ecclesiastes. See, there are people who can see this. Jesus took a whip and chased out these people making money in the name of religion. And say, well, God's called me to have a whip. And uh, there are people who, when they preach every single Sunday, they have a whip. They say, I'm following Jesus. But remember, Jesus used the whip only two days 
in three and a half years. So many times he went to the temple and these guys were there, but only twice in three and a half years. See the proportion. Three and a half years, about a thousand days, and two days out of a thousand is point two percent or something like that. <clears throat> so he didn't do it every day. I don't know whether you know that Jesus did it twice. This is towards the end of his life, because very soon after that he goes to the cross. And the other is in John chapter 2, at the beginning of his ministry, right at the beginning, John chapter 2 is the first miracle is at Cana. And then he went into the temple, John 2, 15, and he made a scourge of cords and he uh, turned the people out and overturned their tables, John 2, 15. And he said, stop making my father's house a place of business, verse 16, last part. That's the beginning of his ministry. But in three and a half years, those fellows had all come back. You know, it's something you cleanse even in a church and after a while it's all come back again. That's why sometimes we need to preach the same message again and again and again and again. Because things that you cleanse once come back again and pretty, pretty soon. And so these guys had come back again in this time. And, uh, and he, Jesus didn't get upset every day and keep on chasing them out. He, he had a time and a season for everything. But notice one difference. Here, verse 16, it's, uh, you made my father's house a place of business. And in Mark, these are little things that you can see. In Mark 12 or Mark 11, he says, in Mark eleven seventeen, you have made my father's house a robber's den. The house of business, it was bad as it was, verse 16, and had become a robber's den. These people who were doing business in God's house were now become thieves. They had descended to a lower level in those three and a half years. Well, I'm sure after the crucifixion resurrection, they went back to that business again. Because we see it happening all over Christendom today. <laughs> the money changers are back in the temple. So it's, but Jesus was led by the Father in all these things. So many things I see in his life. You know, you're well familiar with uh, John chapter 12. Just showing you a few instances like this to show the way he lived, to walk as Jesus walked. John, no, sorry, John chapter 11. You read. He got a message, verse 3, when Lazarus was sick, verse 2, John 11, 2 and 3, Lord, he whom you love is sick. That's all. They know. He'll understand who it is. And again, his reaction. Now, if we hear somebody seriously sick, whom we love, we rush. Jesus heard this. It's interesting. Jesus heard this and he stayed. Verse 6, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two days longer. It was so contrary to human reaction. Somebody I love is sick, oh, then I better stay here two more days, don't go yet. And not just two days, by the time he reached, Lazarus was dead for four days. Of course, that's because Jesus had to walk all that distance. But anyway, there was a, he moved only when he was prompted by the Father. Once the two days were over, then in verse 7 he said, okay, let's go to Judea now. And he went there. He was, he lived according to a timetable that the Father had made for him. And that's why his life was so effective. Every day he accomplished exactly what the Father wanted him to do. Because he was listening. Like you read in Isaiah 50, verse 4, in the morning you opened my ear, and that doesn't mean, like in the early days when I read it, right in the beginning of my Christian life walk, I thought it means in the early morning I would start reading the Bible. Good. And, you know, at each stage we live according to the understanding we have, then God leads us further. But then I realized that it was the morning, his ears were open and it was never shut throughout the day. He was just listening the whole day. So I realized that it's not just a question of reading the Bible in the morning. 
but listening throughout the day. It's an attitude of listening while I'm doing all my other work. It's not conscious listening, but conscious listening at times, but unconscious listening most of the time. It's like breathing. Maybe times when we do some deep breathing exercises, but otherwise we are breathing unconsciously all the time. And that's how we live. You can say physically man should live by breathing all the time. And spiritually man should live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Uh, again, all the time. See, that's what Jesus said in the temptation in Matthew 4. It's interesting that this is the, these are the first words of his public ministry. Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The very first words of his public ministry began with his response to Satan in time of temptation, saying, this is the most important thing, to hear every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, not that proceeded 1500 years ago when Moses wrote Genesis and Numbers and Deuteronomy, but proceeds present continuous. Present continuous means something that's happening all the time. So God is speaking all the time. I may not be listening all the time, but God is speaking all the time. I use the example of, you know, there are voices right now here. All I need is a, a radio set here to hear those voices. And I can choose which frequency to turn to. Which of these voices in this room I want to listen to. It's like that, the devil is always speaking, God's always speaking. And if I'm not tuned into that frequency, I don't hear a thing. I, mean, I, don't, I don't hear all the music going on or there are sermons going on here right now <laughs> in the air. But I don't hear any of it. I have to be attuned to that frequency and I believe that's the picture I get. Of. In the midst of a world where there's so many voices, so many things that come into our mind, I can in the midst of it all listen to the voice of God if I develop the habit. And if, I, if God sees in my heart, Lord, I want to hear you. It's the greatest longing in my heart to hear you because according to your word, the first word you spoke in your public ministry, all spiritual life is dependent on listening to the word that is proceeding constantly from the mouth of God. I want to live spiritually. I don't want spiritual death to come into any part of my life. And uh, because if I'm living spiritually, I know I'll be a blessing wherever I go. And I'll be a blessing all the time I'm awake, I'll be a blessing. That means other I'll fulfill your purpose because I'm attuned to the voice of God. It doesn't come quickly, but over a period of time, you'll be amazed to see how the Holy Spirit works in you because he sees in you a great passion to live by the word that's continuously proceeding from God's mouth. Think of how much we have missed in our past years. Be renewed by the spirit of your mind that you may prove the perfect will of God means the more God speaks to you and you obey, the more your mind will begin to think like God thinks. That is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It means to think like God thinks. Then I can walk like Jesus walked. I can, I begin to think like God thinks. Then I can walk like Jesus walked. You know, go into the temple one day and see all the terrible things happening and do nothing. Come back the next day and do something violent. And people won't understand it. The best part of some of these things is where you know, after he, Jesus, they'd seen Jesus come to the temple so many times. And they saw all these things. It was three and a half years it was going on. And he never does anything. <laughs> and one day he, do you know he made the whip the first time? 
the second time, I don't know where he got it from, but in John chapter 2, it says, he sat down and made a whip. And this, he's tell the disciples, get, get a little cords, few cords together. They're wondering what he wants. He sits down there and makes a whip. If you didn't notice that, I'm going to show it to you. These are little, little things. John chapter 2, uh, verse 15. He made... A scourge of cords. I don't know where the disciples went and got all those cords from, but anyway, they got it. And he sits down there and twists it all together, and they're wondering what in the world he's doing. And he chases these people out. The I don't think he whipped the people, he whipped the sheep and the oxen. And turned the tables and and the best part of it at the end of it is. He doesn't tell his disciples, hey, fellas, I didn't lose my temper. I was just felt prompted by God to do it. You know, what a lust there is for us to explain to people, I didn't lose my temper there. Just in case you misunderstand, you know, I want to preserve my testimony before you people. He couldn't care less for the testimony of the disciples. They can think what they like. That's your freedom from the opinion of the people he loved the most. It's quite okay. If you know me, you will never misunderstand what I do. So many times like that, you know, once he told his disciples, how long shall I be with you, you people of unbelief? Then afterwards he says, he doesn't say, by the way, I didn't lose my temper. I just wanted to speak something strongly to you. I really like that. I, I've learned a few lessons from there myself. To walking as Jesus walked, this tremendous desire to explain lest people think of less of me spiritually than they should think. They should think I'm a godly man and uh, I don't want that opinion to go away so I have to explain so much. If you get into that habit, you'll be a slave of men. But Jesus was so free from that and I, I love that. He listened and he spoke. And to me, that is actually the message in the first page of the Bible. In Genesis 1. What is the message in the first page of the Bible? <clears throat> God, let me uh, spiritually read chapter 1 in a spiritual meaning. In the beginning, God created man perfect. But the devil came in and messed up his life and man became, lost the shape of God. Man became empty, verse 2, and became dark. But God didn't give up on man. The Holy Spirit immediately started working on this man because God wanted to restore him to his image. And uh, not just the Holy Spirit, but God's word, because man shall live by every word that proceeds from God's mouth. And so God speaks and the first thing he does is bring light. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says that is indicating that Christ comes into our lives. We are born again. And God examines it and he says that's good. And then of course immediately you have to separate the light from the darkness. That means this born again person has to be separated from all the be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And what fellowship is light with darkness? He's separating himself from everything that's contrary to God's light that he finds in his life, that is verse 4, because the light is good, God separated the light from the darkness. He didn't want a sort of a mixture of light and darkness, it's like a dusk type of situation, he wanted clear light. And if you separate the light from the darkness, it becomes like that. And the next day God speaks again, and again, every day, at the end of the day, it says God examined it, verse 12, God saw it was good. God saw it was good, verse 18. He speaks every day. And that is the message I get from the Bible. That once God has picked me up from the mess of verse 2, and allows the Holy Spirit to move upon me, and speaks God's word. It's two things, the Holy Spirit and God's word. Holy Spirit, verse 2, God's word, verse 3. There's two things that must always work in me every day. I'm slowly changed, not suddenly. Day by day by day. 
I'm renewed, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4:16. Uh, our outward man decays day by day, but our inward man is renewed day by day. When I read that verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, I am reminded of Genesis 1, where the renewal of that physical earth, which is corrupted by the fall of Satan between verse 1 and 2, took place day by day by day. By what? By earth listened to the word of God every day. And every day a miracle took place. That's the other message I get there. That if I listen to God's word, <clears throat> something miraculous will happen. Not what the world calls a miracle. It doesn't have to be external. Something within. A miracle within. Every day. It's an amazing passage. You can, there's a lot you can meditate on right there in Genesis chapter 1. And if I keep listening to it every day, uh, the end of it is, uh, I come to a life of rest. Genesis 2 verse 2. The final end is, you know, God wants my life to be one of rest, to enter into the rest of God. It says in Hebrews 4, he who believes has entered into rest. Do you know that God's will for you is that you live it a life of rest all the time, no matter what happens around you? Just like Jesus sleeping on a pillow in the boat when there's a storm around him. It's a perfect picture of how God wants us to live on this earth. There's storms around and... But if I listen and listen and listen, I will enter into rest. That's what I learned from Genesis 1 and 2. And if Adam had continued listening on the eighth day, and Eve had continued listening on the eighth day, they wouldn't have gotten the other tree of knowledge you would have eaten. But they stopped listening. They were supposed to listen. Of course, it was their first day. For them, it was the second day when they went into Eden. When God kept them that first day of their life with him, they said, hey, you've got to listen to me. Spend this day listening to me. The work in the garden can wait. The first day after man was created, he was in a Sabbath. There's a difference between law and grace. In the law, it says six days you shall work, and the seventh day you shall rest. Under grace, God says, you rest the first day like Adam, and then go and work six days. So I learned something from there that in the new covenant, I have to come to rest first and then go to work uh, because I'm following God's original plan for Adam. It's wonderful. There's so many things in scripture. If, uh, <clears throat> if I want to see it, it's, it's like, there's a verse that I've often thought of, Proverbs 25 and verse 2. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. <clears throat> there are a lot of things concealed in scripture. And uh, we are kings in Christ, kings and priests. And it's the glory of God to conceal these things in scripture. They're not on the surface. You probably saw some things today which are not on the surface. But it's the glory of a king to go and search it out. I believe there are a lot of good things you can get on the surface too, like on the earth, you know, on the surface of the earth there are apples and oranges and wheat and rice and everything, which is all we need. But if you go deeper, you get gold and diamonds and a whole lot of other things which are thousands of times more expensive than the apples and oranges you get on the surface. It's like that. I see the Bible like that. You can get a lot of things on the surface. People are taken up with, Jesus healed the sick and Jesus did this. That's good. <laughs> but a lot of people who talk so much about that. Not, there's no healing in their ministry. They're just fooling everybody. But if you go into the depth of scripture, you see the principles by which Jesus lived. And then you live a fulfilled life instead of a frustrated life. Otherwise you pursue after things which God never wants you to do. So, this habit of listening, I find always, always, always uh, <clears throat> in when I was a very young Christian, soon after I was, I was baptized in 1961 when I was 21 years old. And one of the first things God spoke to me after that was from Luke chapter 10. 
And I'm very thankful that I heard it way back at the beginning of my Christian life. It's a story of verse 38 to 42, Martha and Mary, you know that story that Martha, as soon as Jesus came, began to go to the kitchen and it says in verse 40, she was distracted with all her preparations or as the mar margin says, with much work, distracted with much service. That's what the margin of my Bible says in Luke 10, 40. And you know, you can do much service for God and be distracted. Distracted from what? Distracted from the most important thing, which is to listen to what he is trying to tell you. And we can find a satisfaction. I find a lot of Christians like this. I found this in CFC Bangalore too. People who are so helpful after Sunday to clear up things and to do so many things at a conference time, especially what a lot of work has to be done. They do this, they do that. They are distracted with much service, not listening to God in those days. See, I've got to do this, I've got to do this. Of course you've got to do it. But in the midst of it all, if I am not listening, I missed out the most important thing. And if I listen, it doesn't mean I'll do less. In fact, I'll do things more efficiently. And actually, it'll do more for God if I listen first or listen all the time. And it, the, one, the other thing about distraction is you compare yourself with others and you feel that your, others are not working as hard as you are. And you begin to complain. That's, when you listen to God, I'll tell you, you don't complain about others. That's one of the wonderful things. You'll never do what Martha did. Go to Jesus and say, look at this sister of mine. She's done comparing yourself with others. They're, they're not, I'm working so hard and this one's not working so hard. All that is the result of not listening. If you're listening to the Lord, you don't have that complaint. You just do what the Lord tells you to do and you're not worried whether other people are doing things or not. Sometimes you do what other people are supposed to do. You just do that work and you don't think it's a great thing that you help somebody out. I remember years ago when early days when we had just built our first building in 1981 or 82. It's going back 35 years. You know, there were, we were a small group those days and to clean up the hall and all. We had to, a lot of different people had to do different things on a particular day of the week. And <clears throat> the guy who was supposed to clean the toilets were not, didn't turn up. So, I was wondering where he was, why hadn't he come? And the Lord said, why are you waiting for somebody? <laughs> why don't you go and do it yourself? <laughs> and that's the day the Lord said to me, my house is your house. You wait for somebody to come to your house to flush the toilet or clean up? Do you really think this is somebody else's house? Treat my house as your house. I said, Lord, I'll do that. From now on, your house is my house. There's no difference. It's all the same. I'm not doing a special favor if I clean the toilet in my house to anybody. I'm not, I'm not waiting for anybody else from the church to come and clean the toilet in my house. Why should I wait for anybody else to do something? If somebody's not there, I just do it myself. <clears throat> and I don't think I've done a great task if I clean up my house. I don't ever think I've done a great task if I did something in God's house. No, there's no... Self-congratulation at the end of it, I did something. Some of these other fellows didn't turn up, but I turned up. That's the thing which destroys us. This comparison of other. It's Martha. <clears throat> much service, much service. <clears throat> unrest, unrest, unrest. And I come to Jesus and the Lord said, Martha, you're bothered about so many things. Martha could have said, Lord, I'm cooking for you. I'm not cooking for myself. Okay. But you shouldn't be cooking for me if you're distracted and worried and complaining and grumbling. That's not the way to serve me. I don't want that service. <clears throat> I'd rather go hungry. Let's fast. Rather than you getting all distracted and upset. And I don't want it. You see, the Lord's values are so different from our human values. Food is not the most important thing for Him. If I'm going to be at unrest and <clears throat> my service for Him is not what He wants. Only one thing is necessary, verse 42. This is the word the Lord spoke to me years ago, soon after my baptism. And that is what Mary has chosen. What she did was listen. 
verse 39, sitting at the Lord's feet, apparently doing nothing. Listen. And when you read about Jesus going and spending hours in prayer, early morning and things like that, he wasn't telling, I don't believe he was talking to the Father. He was listening to the Father. Much more than talking to most people, Prayer is telling God this, 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 this is like a laundry list or a you know a shopping list rather. This is all I want. But that's not what prayer is meant to be. <clears throat> and the way God spoke to my heart at that time and even later was if I'm speaking to somebody on a telephone. The other person on the other end is a very godly man, much more senior to me. I will listen more than I speak. But if the other person is much younger than me, I may speak more than I listen. So, how is it if God is at the other end? Ask yourself. Do you listen more than you speak? Or do you feel you've got to tell God a few things which you may not know? Who is at the other end of the phone? Is it someone younger than you? <clears throat> if I hear you on, on a phone for one hour, I can tell you who is at the other end of the phone, whether he's younger than you or older than you. Whether he's a much more godly person at the other end or a young brother. And if I can hear you pray, I can hear, I can tell you whether you believe God is younger than you or older. So I, then I understood these words like pray without ceasing, what it really meant. Because I used to, as a young Christian, I used to read about these great men of God, great men of God, who pray for two hours and four hours. And <laughs> I used to get discouraged. <laughs> I was never encouraged reading that. Uh, somebody prayed all night. And I was young, 20. 21, 22 years old, and I said, okay, I'm going to pray all night. So I was on the ship, and I knelt down. I had a, because I was an officer, I had a cabin to myself. I knelt down by my bed, 9 o'clock, I'm going to pray all night. <laughs> I pray and pray and pray. It's only 9.30. <laughs> I never seemed to get, every other day, the morning seemed to come pretty quickly. <laughs> I slept through much. This day it came so slowly. Finally, I made it on my knees after six o'clock in the morning and I'd accomplished it. What did I get? Half, half the time I was sleepy, waking myself up, and I could say I prayed all night. To impress whom? Myself. Or somebody else if I foolishly testified about it. God is not impressed. I believe what I needed to learn was to listen, the habit of listening. And when you're listening and listening and listening, there are many times when you have to spend more time listening, even sometimes you wake up in the middle of the night and you listen. So there's where I discovered and what I have preached is true prayer. So I'm not trying to get into the Guinness Book of Records of how long I prayed or any such thing. People ask me how long do you pray, Brother Zach? And I say, you want, to, you want me to disobey Matthew 6, which says you shouldn't tell people <laughs> to pray. And secondly, if you want an answer, the Bible says, Jesus said, Matthew 18, 1, pray always. And 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, 18 says, pray without ceasing. <clears throat> so I realized that how in the world am I going to pray without ceasing? How in the world am I going to pray always? There's the only two verses that tell us how long we have to pray for. There are no other verses in the whole Bible to tell us how long we have to pray for. Luke 18, 1 and 1 Thessalonians 5, is it 17 or 18? Pray without ceasing. So then I examine my own life and what's the thing I do 24 hours without ceasing? It's breathing. So I learned from that that praying must be like breathing. And most of it is listening. I'm trying to get spiritual oxygen into my system and to get rid of all the spiritual 
carbon dioxide and other gases from my system. Eliminate all that and get pure oxygen. That's, that's prayer. Because I thought of, <clears throat> okay, we pray for people, and I do. You know, when somebody's sick, you pray for them. To me, it is like God giving me the privilege of working with him in something I'm doing. I, I'll tell you honestly that when I go anywhere, I write to all the elders to pray for me. I'm going for this conference, I'm going for this conference, I'm going here, please pray for me. Because I believe there is a power in prayer. It's not that I despise it. And it, uh, there are specific things we need to pray for. Paul used to pray for the Christians in different churches. And there are different complicated situations we had to pray. We've got to bind Satan's activities and resist Satan in prayer as well and ask God for wisdom in certain situations. So I'm not saying that we don't speak to God. We do. But we must speak knowing that uh, God already knows, first of all. We're not going to inform God about anything that he doesn't know. I need to remember that. I don't have to tell God some, something like, in case you didn't know God, this is happening here. you got to do something. No, he knows everything. So I see my telling God and asking him to do things like God giving me the privilege of doing a little thing to show that I work with him. It's like, okay, we've got to feed these 5,000 men and many women and children, 10,000 people. I can just do it by creating bread and fish from nothing. But I won't do it like that. The Lord says, give me whatever you have. Give me your five loaves and two fish and then we'll feed the multitude. It's always like that. You know, every miracle is almost like that. Most, a number of miracles. You pour the water into the water pots, I'll turn it into wine. I'll do the 99% difficult part. You do something. Otherwise, Jesus could have filled those water pots with wine without any water in it at all. Sure. Why doesn't he do it that way? Then it'll be all his work. But he came on earth to make us co-workers with him. So that's the purpose of praying with God. When we understand these things, we know how to pray correctly. We are working with God, but it's a very small part we do. Roll the stone away. I'll raise the dead. That part I'll do, but you at least... And Jesus could have rolled the stone away with one word. Why does he ask them to roll the stone away? No, you do the easy part. I'll do the difficult part. I'll raise the dead. And after he raised from the dead, he still says, you've got one more thing to do. Take away all this bandage which is around uh, Lazarus. You do the easy part. But he does want us to do something so that we have the privilege of being co-workers with him. And I see the tremendous lesson there in my serving God. Uh, there's a small part I have to do. It's like the illustration I use of if I want to carry my uh, coffee table to the small coffee table to the next room. And my little three-year-old son says, Dad, I want to help you. I won't say, get away, you're going to be a nuisance. You, you cause more problems. No, I say, sure, hold that corner of the table. And he holds the corner of the table and I, <laughs> not really taking any weight. But he has such a thrill that he goes and tells mom, you know, mom, dad and I carry the table to the other room. That's the thing God wants. We are co-workers with him. What are we doing? We are carrying the, holding the corner of a table. That's all we're doing in all the so-called work we're doing for God. And that's the right way to serve him. So it all comes out of this habit of listening. One thing is needful. Do I really believe Luke 10, 42? It's not my service. My service will be effective if I listen. It's not that Mary didn't do anything. We read in John chapter 12, you know, that she broke that alabaster vial of ointment and the whole perfume filled the whole house. So you can have a service that blesses everybody. And Jesus said, what this woman has done will be said, spoken around the world. For 2,000 years, people have been talking about what Mary did. Which is not such a fantastic service in terms of how many souls were saved, but the odor of Christ has filled the whole room because she had the habit of listening. So I see a lot of spiritual lessons from this. What that good part, Luke 10 42, which Moses Mary has chosen, will not be taken away from her. And many, many times, you know, sometimes I've said, Lord, today is my birthday, on my birthday, and, and said, Lord, you have a word for me. 
what brings me to a few years later i asked the lord lord you have word for me on my birthday one thing is needful so the lord has reminded me of that so many times in these 57 years since i took my baptism and it's a wonderful thing I want to pass on to you. Man shall not live by bread alone or here by activity or even doing God's work. It's by listening first. Sit at his feet and listen. You'll accomplish a lot more because the little that you do. Otherwise, it's like Philip saying, Lord, 200 pennies of money cannot feed these 10,000 people and you'll try to do it. And then each person will get a little crumb. But if you do it God's way, there's 12 baskets left over at the end of it all. Everybody's got plenty and filled and I hope you know why he left 12 baskets at the end. So that he could reward the 12 disciples to take something home for serving him. Each of you take a basket home. It wasn't, by the way, it wasn't leftovers. They were, it wasn't sort of fragments that people ate and threw away. It's the actual food that was good bread and fish that had not yet been distributed everybody was satisfied so each disciple could take a basket home to his family and i often say that to people who are serving the lord remember this my brothers sisters that if you serve god you'll find at the end of the day god has got a basket for your family he will never let you down anyone who serves god god takes care of his family abundantly they get more than what you distribute it's wonderful to see these things in scripture. Uh, I want to show you another passage now in Deuteronomy in chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Uh, at the end of the 40 years of wandering, Moses tells the Israelites, you must remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years to humble you, testing you to know whether you'd keep his commandments or not. And how did he humble you in these 40 years? By allowing you to be hungry and feeding you with manna which you did not know. Why did he feed you with manna every day? To teach you one lesson, that man, verse 3, does not live by bread alone, but that man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. You had to go every morning and cut the manna. And that was to teach you that early in the morning you must allow God to open your ears to listen because then only you can live, man shall live. You know, you guys wouldn't be living, living in the wilderness. You would have perished in the wilderness if you hadn't got that manna every day. So you had to go out and it says they had to do it before the sun became hot because then it would all melt, they wouldn't get it. It's somewhere else in scripture, it says that. Exodus or Numbers or somewhere. So they had to be diligent, otherwise they'd starve. And their families would starve. So they had to go out and get it and to teach man that, and that was the food for the whole day. They lived on that. There was no manna coming in the afternoon. It was in the morning, it was for the whole day. It was the three meals they had with that. And it was not just, uh, you know, you pick it up and eat it. It's Numbers 11. Someone pointed out this to me the other day, which is Numbers 11, verse 7. The manna was like coriander seed, and its appearance was like a costly stone, precious stone, jellium, shining. And then people would go out and gather it, and look at the amount of work they had to do before they could eat it, grind it between two millstones or beat it in the mortar, boil it in the pot, and make cakes with it. So it wasn't just pick it up and eat it, share it with everybody. 
there's a lot of it's like you buy wheat from the market in India and you grind it, grind it, you make it powdered wheat and then you make bread, something like that here. So there was a lot of work before it became food. So that's what we got to do when we listen to. When I listen to God, I have to meditate on what he said to me. Blessed is a man who meditates on God's word day and night. You know, that's chew on it. What I received, work hard to grind this and powder it and uh, cook it. And then I can eat it. So in other words, there's a lot of work I have to do with what I've heard from God. And to let it sink into my system. It's not like a command, do this, go there, go here. Because a person who's just listening and does may never become like God. He just does, obeys the commands. But God's interested in transforming me into his likeness. It, you know what we read in Romans 12 too, if you remember. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So the renewing of our mind comes through listening to God every day and that leads to transformation of our character into the likeness of Christ. It's something like food we eat. The food I eat does not make my body strong. It is, it's, there's a lot of process going on inside the body with that food over a period of hours before the bread and the curry and everything is converted into flesh and blood and bones. There's a process and that's something I have to do with God's word as well. So listening to God's word every day. I, The more I've seen again about the way Jesus walked, you know, to see certain instances where I see because of this listening habit, one or two instances which I've mentioned before as well, Luke 19. You read that, well, you know the story of Zacchaeus who was climbing up on a tree. And Jesus was going with a huge crowd down the road. But because he was in this habit of constant touch with the Holy Spirit, as he goes down the road, the Holy Spirit says, stop. And he stops. Look up in the tree. Jesus was a man, remember. 100% like us. We can walk like he walked. There's a man sitting there, and just by the way, his name is Zacchaeus. It's amazing what God can do through us if we listen. We need to go to his house. Okay? Never mind what the people say. The people all began to say, verse 7, he's gone to the house of a sinner. There was a man who got salvation in his house that day. Salvation has come to this house, verse 9. Imagine if he hadn't stopped. Zacchaeus was so reserved, he wouldn't go up to Jesus at all. Jesus had to go to him. I say, Lord, I don't want to miss out on anybody I'm supposed to draw to in my life because I was too lazy to listen to you. I don't want it to happen. It probably happened a lot in my past life. But I want to live listening. There's somebody who has to be blessed through, through you. And you don't have to be a great Bible scholar to do that. You just have to listen. But it's a habit. I need to be gripped by one thing is needful, brothers. And Mary has chosen that good part. And it will not be taken away. It won't be taken away from you also if you develop this habit. Listen, listen, listen. I think of another place. It's in Matthew 15. Here we read that Jesus was in Galilee. But all of a sudden, you know, he was speaking to Peter in verse 15, Matthew 15, 15 explaining a certain parable 
about, you know, you won't get defiled by what you eat, but what comes out of your mouth, that's what defiles you. And at the end of that, having said all that in verse 19 and 20, it says Jesus and his disciples went away from there, from Galilee to the Tyre of, district of Tyre and Sidon. And when I read that, I go, I stop and I go to the back of my Bible and I say, okay, let me see how far is Tyre and Sidon from Galilee. And I say, wow, that was a number of miles that he had to walk to go Tyre and Sidon, about 70 miles from the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so in a little sentence like that, I see a lot of things happening. How long does it take to walk 70 miles? Two, three miles an hour? 20, 20, 30 hours? Even if you walk 10 hours a day? Remember, no chariot. He took three days. So what you read there is, he walked three days. And I learned something from that, just by looking at a map. If you read the scriptures really passionately longing, to walk as Jesus walked. A lot of things the Lord will show you. He walked three days to go to Tyre and Sidon because he was prompted by the Holy Spirit. Now you've got to go. Go to Tyre and Sidon. That's the, about the only time he went outside Israel. He often said, God, I've been sent only to the Lord Sheep of Israel. He said that later on. But he went outside Israel and for one woman, and that woman was a Canaanite. One of those Canaanites who were not killed by the Israelites 1500 years earlier. They were supposed to finish off all the Canaanites, but they were not all killed. This Canaanite woman survived and uh, descended of one of those who were not killed. And she said, have mercy, Lord, son of David. Somehow she knew this is the son of David. She's a Canaanite. She's not an Israelite. My daughter is cruelly demons. He did not answer a word. And the disciples were all there. They said, send her away. She's just shouting at us. And he said, no, I have been sent only, verse 24, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then why in the world have you come to Tyre and Sidon? Prompted by the Holy Spirit. The natural man does not understand the spiritual man. And uh, he says, Lord, help me. And he says, I can't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. It looks as if it's so rude to call a woman a dog. That was the leading of the Holy Spirit, even there. And she said, yes, Lord, then the dogs can eat the crumbs. And this is the second time I see Jesus telling someone, your faith is great. It was the Roman centurion. He never said it to his disciples, even once. The people who had studied the Bible, who had heard the Bible from childhood, they never had faith. But this two people who had never read the Bible, Roman centurion and this Syrophoenician woman, they had faith. It's not by a lot of Bible study and Bible knowledge that we have faith. It's an attitude of the heart. People who don't know the Bible as much, who know the Bible, 1% of you may have more faith than you. That's what I see here. And great is your faith. It was for this reason Jesus called her a dog so that she would respond with that. I believe, you know, Jesus spoke in the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And even that, though it may look like something just said it like that. No, he said it under the prompting of the Holy Spirit. As much as he told the Pharisees, he was without sin, cast the first stone at the woman caught in adultery. Here, prompted by the Holy Spirit, to say, no, I can't give this to the dogs. And then there'll be a response, which he will show you and show the disciples. He was wanting the disciples to see that, to see the faith this woman has. And daughter was healed at once. And what does he do that next? He's finished one healing. And he walks 70 miles back, verse 29. He went back to the Sea of Galilee. So as I see, he walked six days, three days up, three days down, to help one person. And I said, Lord, make me like that I'll go six days to help one person. That I don't count my ministry in terms of statistics. 
How many people did you reach with all that effort? One person. And at the end of it, he'll say in John 17, 4, Father, I finished the work you gave me to do. He never counted by statistics. Sometimes we can think, oh, I wish I could do like that great preacher who reaches so many people. I'm, I tell you honestly, I have absolutely no desire for that. I want to reach the one here and the one there and the one in the other place. Uh, you know, we get so many emails in CFC and all poor unknown people, many of them from many other churches whose pastors have no time for them because they are poor. They are not the great contributors to the church. They have serious problems in their marriage, with their children who are sick, and they write to CFC. And I read it and I say, I don't answer all those mails. There are many uh, fellow elders, senior elders who answer many themselves. But I read almost all of them. And I say, boy, what a needy place the world is. And they don't know whom to turn. I often think of that verse which Jesus said in, uh, it says in Matthew 9, that Jesus felt compassion in verse 36, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's exactly how I felt when I get all these emails. And I read them. And that's one of the reasons many times I go to bed at midnight. Most of the time, responding to people. Not just the elders, but different people with problems. And, and you know, the, I think it's a message paraphrase which says, verse 30, seeing the people in broken heart. It broke the heart to see people like sheep without anybody to guide them. I feel a lot of Christians today sitting in many churches where pastors are only interested in their money and urging them to give more and more money. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And you don't have to be a pastor or a full-time worker to be you just got to have a heart like Jesus, a heart that breaks when you see the lost condition of people around you, eyes that are open to see what's happening, a ear that's open to listen to what God is saying. It will break your heart as well. And the Lord says, the harvest is plentiful, the workers of you. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And when they did that, in the next verse it says, Jesus summoned the 12 disciples and sent them out to these needy people. So this is the way God wants these things are written for our instruction. All scripture is given for us to become perfect. It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that the man of God may be instructed in the way of righteousness and corrected so that we become perfect and so that we can help the needy people in the world around us. So, I pray it'll be like that for all of us. And one of the byproducts of this I found in my life is that uh, you know, we read in Isaiah 50 verse 4, so turn back to that, maybe we can conclude with that, Isaiah 50, and you listen. The result of listening, Isaiah 50 verse 4. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear, the last part of verse 4, to listen. And the result of it is, verse 4, the first part, you get a tongue of a disciple to sustain the weary people you meet with a word, not necessarily with a long message. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's it. A word. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what's God's. That's it. He was without sin. Throw the first stone. That's more than a big one-hour message. And to sustain people with a word. Be of good cheer. 
your sins are forgiven. So, I see that you'll have a word if you, this becomes a habit in your life. You'll have a word for needy people all the time. All the time. Continuously. In your heart. I mean, not in a day or two. But if you develop the habit from the time you're young, maybe 20 years from now, if the Lord tarries, not just 20 years from but increasingly, your life will become very effective to have a word for everybody, not just to be a popular person who cracks jokes and makes fun and, as they say, the life of the party. Not that type of stuff, but to have a word that sustains the weary one. The world is full of weary people. You can sustain them by a word that you have heard from God because you've developed this habit. So it's a wonderful thing, to, a wonderful habit to develop. Thank you, Father, for the amazing things that are in your scriptures. We pray like the psalmist, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your word. Open our eyes that we see these wondrous things in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.